Hello honors chemistry students, this is Mr. Spurk and this is your chapter 5 section 3 notes on the atomic emission spectra and the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So we're going to talk about light a lot in this section and then we'll do a couple of labs this week dealing with light. So by 1900 scientists knew that light consisted of waves or that light traveled in waves. So we need to talk about the anatomy of a wave. So you can look at the diagram on the right as we go over the definitions. So the amplitude is the wave's height from the zero line to the crest. So the zero line you can think about like an axis. So it's from the height from the zero to the crest. And then wavelength, which is this symbol lambda. It looks like an upside down Y. This is the distance between the crests. So that's the wavelength. The frequency of a wave, and that is the symbol nu, it looks like a uh, curvy V. Uh, the frequency is similar to what you think of when you think of the word frequent. It is the number of wave cycles to pass a given point per unit of time. And we measure frequency in Hertz, or capital HZ, which is also equal to per second or a second to the minus one, which just means the reciprocal of second. So the product of frequency and wavelength equals a constant, and that constant is the speed of light. So an equation that we're going to use throughout this section is C equals lambda nu. So frequency and wavelength, nu and lambda, are inversely proportional which means as one increases, the other decreases. So you can look here, when we have low frequency, we have a long wavelength, so low frequency, high wavelength. And you look here on the right, we have high frequency and short wavelength. So light consists of electromagnetic waves, um, which we also call EM radiation or electromagnetic radiation. And that includes things like radio waves, microwaves, infrared waves, visible light, UV waves, X-rays, and gamma rays. And no need to write all of these down. We will discuss them over and over again. And they are in one of the graphics just below on your paper. All electromagnetic waves travel in a vacuum at a speed of 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which is the speed of light. So the sun and incandescent light bulbs, which are just round light bulbs that you're pretty used to seeing, they emit white light. And white light consists of light with a continuous range of wavelength and frequencies. So you may have heard before that white and black aren't necessarily colors, but black is just the absence of color and white is the absorption of all of the colors. That is what we see here uh, when we look at white light. So when sunlight or white light passes through a prism, the different wavelengths separate into a spectrum of colors. And you've seen this before. Sometimes when light passes through certain glass at different angles or maybe off of a mirror, but you have seen light hit something and create this spectrum. So what you're looking at here is the electromagnetic spectrum. And so we're going to look right now down here at the different types. So again, we have radio waves. We're, gonna, we're not going to talk about radar specifically, but we have microwaves, which are used in, you guessed it, our microwaves. Then we have infrared waves, or IR, which can be used to detect heat. Then we have the visible light spectrum, and this is all of the light and colors that we are able to see. So anything outside of this tiny little band, we are unable to detect with our eyes very easily. Then we have the ultraviolet spectrum, which is used to uh, clean medical tools as well as our safety goggles for class. Then we have x-rays, which can be used to look inside the body, and gamma rays, which are used to uh, fight cancer. So the big takeaways from this graphic here are that on the left end of the spectrum, we have our low energy waves, which are also low frequency, but they have high wavelengths. So large waves that move slowly, therefore they don't have a lot of energy. It's also important to note that this 
in these uh, trends go in the opposite direction as we go across the table here. So you'll notice on this end of the spectrum, we have high energy, we have high frequency, and we have low wavelengths. So tiny little wavelengths that move around with a lot of energy. For this end of the spectrum, I think about little kids. Little kids are small and tend to have a lot of energy. Another big thing to notice is that these ra the range of visible light is Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. So when atoms absorb energy, and we talked a little bit about this before, they can absorb a quantum of energy, their electrons move to higher energy levels. These electrons then lose energy by emitting light when they return to back to lower energy levels. So a prism, again, separates light into its color that it contains, and white light produces a rainbow of colors. So you see here you have your incandescent light bulb, it's passing through a prism, and we see that it separates into a continuous spectrum. However, when we look at um, specific elements in gas tubes, like here we're looking at a helium lamp, we see that it is not a spectrum of lines. So again, look how this is more like a smear of a rainbow of color. And here we have discrete lines. So we're going to look at this in a lab later this week. And so you can see that it's sort of this orange color, the helium lamp, and as it passes through the prism, we see these are its component colors, and they are in very specific places. The energy absorbed by an electron for it to move to a higher energy level is identical to the energy of light that's emitted by the electron as it drops back to its original energy level. So the wavelengths of the spectral lines are characteristic of the element that they make up the atomic emission spectrum of that element. No two elements have the same emission spectra. So the one we were just looking at for helium, that is specific to helium. No other of the 118 elements have that atomic emission spectra. So let's look at a sample problem. Let's calculate the wavelength of yellow light that's emitted by a sodium lamp if the frequency of radiation is 5.09 times 10 to the 14th hertz. So our equation is C equals lambda nu. Let's fix that there. C equals lambda nu. So we are solving for the wavelength. So let's algebraically rearrange this. So to get lambda alone, we need to divide both sides by nu. So our equation is lambda equals C over nu. C is that constant, which is the speed of light, 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, divided by nu, or our frequency, which is given to us in the problem as 5.09 times 10 to the 14 per seconds, or hertz. So we just need to calculate that out. So remember, we would type 3.00E8, close that parenthesis, divided by, open a new parenthesis, 5.09E14, press enter, and we get an answer or a wavelength of 5.89 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. So this is the wavelength, and we will talk later about how to convert these into nanometers. So then we have this scientist named Max Planck, and he determined that the amount of radiant energy of a single quantum absorbed or emitted by a body is proportional to the frequency of radiation. So this is just another equation we have here. So this is that the energy is equal to H times nu, and that H is what we know as Planck's constant, and Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule times seconds. So let's do a sample problem here. What is the energy of a photon of microwave radiation with a frequency of 3.2 times 10 to the 11 per seconds, or hertz? So again, we have E equals H nu. 
So let's plug in Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. Multiply that by our frequency, 3.20 times 10 to the 11th per seconds. So as we type that into our calculator, let's look at what our units are going to be. So we're multiplying joule times seconds by per seconds. So we're going to get joule times seconds on top divided by seconds. So the seconds are going to cancel and we are left with joules. And that should be correct because we know that we want to calculate energy in joules. When we plug this into our calculator, we should get energy equal to 2.12 times 10 to the negative 22nd joules. All right, now we're going to talk about this guy, Albert Einstein, who I'm sure you've heard of before. And he discovered the photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect can come in handy uh, when we're looking at metals um, and in the inorganic chemistry industry. So the photoelectric effect says that electrons are ejected when light shines on metal. So we have what we call incident photons. And photons are just pieces of light. So we know that light is, uh, has wave-like characteristics and particle-like characteristics. So it's these little pieces of energy that travel in a wave like this. So we have our incident photons. They come in and they hit our metal material, which of course is made of elements, which has protons, neutrons, and electrons. And when those incident photons come in, electrons are then ejected from the metal, which can allow electricity to flow. Now, it doesn't just take any frequency of light will cause the photoelectric effect. It requires a certain frequency. And so when we uh, want to think about this, we want to think that red has low frequency and violet has much higher frequency. So this is why um, UV light uh, or black lights can cause things to light up. So again, looking at the photoelectric effect, you see here we have red light coming in to hit this metal and nothing's happening. So no electrons are ejected because the frequency of light is below the threshold frequency or the frequency that that metal requires to emit an electron. So we move up the spectrum. Let's try green light. We see that uh, if the light is at or above the threshold frequency, electrons are ejected. So here we have one electron ejected. And if the frequency is increased, the ejected electrons will travel faster. So we see those electrons jumping away much quicker. And again, we see those electrons uh, jumping, and then we see it as light, which is the light coming back down to the ground state, or the electron coming back to the ground state. So Einstein proposed that light could be described by quanta of energy that behaves as if they were particles. So it's these pieces of light that are causing things to happen. And he called these light quanta photons. And again, like I said before, he said that light possesses both wave-like and particle-like properties. So you may have heard about wave-particle duality. And that's what this is. So when an electron has its lowest possible energy, the atom is in its ground state. And again, think about that latter depiction we saw in uh, section one. We have the ground state is the lowest energy, or for example, the latter, it's close to the ground. The ground state is typically principal quantum number n equals one, or the first energy level. And excitation by absorbing energy raises the atom to an excited state with electrons where n equals two, three, four, five, or six. Light is then emitted when the electron drops back to a lower energy level. So for example, we see here we have a photon coming in. It hits that electron in the ground state, causing it to jump up to an excited state. And then when that electron comes back down, we'll see the light emitted. And we can see that better here in this depiction. You see we have arrows representing the electrons falling back down to the ground state 
And so notice that the red is for lower energy jumps, which again, red is on the lower end of the energy spectrum, whereas violet is a larger jump, a larger change in energy. And we know that violet light is more energetic than red light. As always, all the information on these slides has been acquired and adapted from Pearson Chemistry 2012 edition of the textbook, the resources CD, and pearsonchem.com. Have a great day.